Ask not for whom the bell tolls. <laughs> Turns out it's tolling for us. Welcome, friends. We're glad to be together in worship this morning. Would you stand and we'll praise the Lord together. We're going to sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
to share this excitement of your coming birthday with all our friends. Hey, good morning everyone. We extend a warm welcome to everybody. We especially welcome this morning members of the, um, of the York Region Police, King Fire and Emergency Services, York Region EMS, along with our Mayor and our Ward Councillors. Thank you for being with us. Um, as we celebrate the Civic Service Appreciation Sunday. We are grateful for your service to our community throughout the year. Um, also want to let you remind you about the Nobleton tree lighting that will take place this afternoon between 4 and 7 p.m. St. Paul's will be represented. And I invite, invite as many of you as possible to join us outside the library on Highway 27 for that event. We need as many hands and voices as possible to help share the good news of Christmas with all our neighbors in the town. We will be offering a simple craft for children to complete. It's a simple candy cane with a little Christmas message on it. Um, we will be handing out cookies with invitations to our worship services over the Christmas season. And we will be singing carols. Um, so it's my hope that you will be available to help out with this e project, even if it's for half an hour. Um, I do have a, uh, a little schedule in half hour increments so that if you're able to sign up to be there for a short period of time to help out, um, hopefully we can be represented across the three hours and not have everybody bunched up in, in the first half hour. Um, so I'll be available after the service if any, anybody has some time to volunteer this afternoon. Also, I'd like to remind you of the 2020 envelopes. They're now available in the, in the lobby. Um, if, you're currently, if you don't currently have a set of giving envelopes for St. Paul's, please speak to Irma Evans. If you prefer to give electronically uh, with pre-authorized remittance or PAR forms, uh, these forms are available on the, on, the, on the rack beside the connection desk in the corner in the lobby. And the Christmas offering. This is an opportunity to give over and above our usual gifts to God's mission as we support special projects. This year the Christmas offering will support Victory House, a woman's interval home in Caledon, the King Township Food Bank, and landscaping projects around the church property. Our goal is $5,000. Envelopes will be in the bulletin each week between now and the end of December. Your generosity is greatly appreciated. And now we will light the Advent, calen uh, Advent candle. Actually, lighting okay. an Advent calendar would be a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus 
is the light of the world, a light no darkness could ever put out. Today we light the first and second candles of Advent. The first candle shines hope, the second candle shines peace. Jesus was standing among them and said, Peace be with you. things are intimidated by <laughs> members of the fire department. <laughs> That's a low wick. There we there, go. There it All right. <laughs> Get your last part and you'll be good. Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, you offer us rest for our hearts and peace for our souls. Help us seek peace in our lives, peace in this community, and peace in the world. Amen. Our lesson for today is taken from Luke chapter 1, verse 39 to 55. Mary visits Elizabeth. A few days later, Mary hurried, Mary hurried to, the hill, uh, to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above, above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of the Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. And Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who follow him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Janet. Hey, it's great to see you this morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, my name's Jeff. If you've not met me before, I, uh, I was away for a little while, but I'm back, and uh, it's good to be back. It's, uh, in a moment, we're going to receive the Lord's offering, and this is an opportunity for us to respond to God. Uh, this is something that is for our regular folks. If you're a regular here, we uh, encourage and uh, expect engagement. Uh, if you're a guest, we don't expect you to give, but you are welcome to do so if you like. And the Christmas offering envelope in your bulletin might be a way to do that. This is uh, a way that we dig into that extra pocket that everybody seems to have at Christmas time, and uh, we use it to support projects that are uh, of some meaning to our community. And our regular tithes and offerings do things like enable us to go to King Print and Design and say, hey, will you make us some postcards? Uh, did these get handed out? Did you all get one of these this morning? Good. Don't keep it. Give it away. If you want one to keep, 
there's a whole lot of extras, so feel free to take an extra one. But my hope is that you will take this and give it away to somebody as a way of inviting them, not only to what we're doing at Christmas time, but on the other side. So one side says, celebrate the reason for the season with St. Paul's. The other side says, celebrate the reason for the season all year with St. Paul's. So uh, it goes beyond the Christmas season. These will be given out today at the tree lighting. And uh, if there's others, we'd be glad to give them to you to give away as well. And our gifts help us produce these kinds of things. So it's a blessing to be able to do that. So those who are going to receive the offering, I'll invite you to come forward. We'll have a word of prayer. And uh, then we'll carry on. As they humbly and reluctantly come up. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to be able to worship you in a tangible way with our gifts. Use them, we pray, to continue to build your kingdom, a kingdom of love and joy and peace and hope, a kingdom that is so in contrast to what this world experiences today. Use our gifts to show the world what you have in store for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord's offering will be received, and we're going to sing... A Canadian traditional Christmas carol, "'Twas in the Moon of Wintertime." We'll remain seated to sing this. This was written uh, by Jean de Brébeuf as, a, as an opportunity to try to present the gospel to First Nations people, uh, in particularly in Huronia. <laughs> Before we go to our community prayer time, I want to uh, offer a bit of a confession. 
And that is, I was tempted to include in my prayers that room be made in the township budget for the removal of snow on driveway approaches. <laughs> At least on Weller Avenue, maybe. <laughs> but I'm going to keep that in my private devotions. <laughs> and we want to uh, experience, express our gratitude to those who are here this morning representing uh, police, fire, EMS, and our uh, municipal council. If uh, those of you who are here doing that today would stand and we'll, uh, we'll acknowledge your presence here this morning. Thanks. Thank you very much. We want to pray for you. We want to uh, show our gratitude and our support for the work that you do, as important as it is in our community. So let's pray together. On this day, Father, when we celebrate the peace that comes with the advent of our Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for all the men and women whose efforts in community service help the rest of us to know at least a taste of what peace can be like. We thank you for the police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and politicians who work hard for the safety and betterment of our community. Many of these friends put their lives on the line on an almost daily basis, and we're in awe of the work they do. Give them your blessing, protection, peace, and even joy in the work they do, for often it can be hard to find peace or joy amid some of the troubling and challenging situations they face. Grant that all of these civic servants will know that the work they do is at your call and your equipping. Remind them daily that they are working not only for the residents they serve, but also for the God of the universe, who've made yourself known in your Son, Jesus Christ, whose advent we celebrate, and in your Holy Spirit, who lives in and through all who follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. We pray for our nation, for those who give leadership at all levels, for those who come to our country as refugees, for those who represent us on the world stage, and for those who quietly seek to eke out a living day by day. Give them and us wisdom as we live in the light of your love. And we pray for our world. We remember those for whom the relative peace we take for granted is far from their reality. We invoke your presence to be with the persecuted and the downtrodden, we pray for the knowledge and wisdom needed to preserve this planet, not only for future generations, but because the earth and everything in it belong to you. We pray for the sick, the hungry, the lonely. Be near them, we ask, and meet them, their needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And meet those needs through us, your partners in kingdom living. And as we turn to your word, Father, we pray that you will open our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts so that in every way we will find ourselves both challenged and encouraged through the message you bring. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, the living word, in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you think I tailored the title of this week's message to some of those who are among us this morning as guests... Uh, you would be absolutely right. It's a terribly gratuitous thing, and I am not a bit ashamed of it. Since 1989, Arrive Alive has been an organization dedicated to using various media to discourage people from driving impaired, whether it be by drugs or alcohol. And I think, to some extent, it's working, because there's now a stigma against drinking and driving that wasn't there when I was a kid. Like, when I was little, it was more like, here, hold my beer while I talk to the police officer. <laughs> Not everybody, of course, is affected by that stigma, so we always know that we can do better as a society. Today, there are stiff punishments for having blood alcohol levels higher than are legally acceptable, and now officials are having to come up with new tests to be able to deal with the folks who are legally ingesting cannabis and such like uh, in this day and age as well. Otherwise, the results could be disastrous. So whether you work to uphold the law or fight fires or tend to emergency illnesses or govern, 
or just try to be an upstanding citizen. It's hard work. Some would say it's no harder than it was in an earlier generation, and that's entirely possible, but certainly we all know more about it today thanks to the reality of social media. But either way, you who serve our community in civic service have difficult and important jobs. We give thanks to God for you, and we pray for you. Each of you, at some level, wants us all to arrive alive. Of course, the challenge with this is that at some point, you know what? We're all going to die. Whether it's in a house fire or at the hands of a drunk driver or some other reason or even just natural causes, each of us is going to breathe our last in these earthly bodies we've been given. But it's my job, my <clears throat> civic service, if you will, uh, to remind us that when these earthly bodies we've been given quit on us, that is not the end. This life is not all there is to this life. It might seem an odd thing to talk about at Christmas time, but you know, if you look at the big picture, it actually isn't an odd thing to talk about at all, because you know, the world's celebration of Christmas has become so shallow and so commercialized that many people have lost the true meaning of Christmas. They've lost what many call the reason for the season. But it's Jesus who wants us to arrive alive. Got to be frank with you for a minute. Not like I'm not usually like that. A lot of people think the church is weird. And you know what? They're right. Absolutely right. The church is weird because it has a different vision of what can be than is evidenced in broader society. And why is that? Well, in the Bible, God paints a picture of what he wants the world to be like. It gets called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And God's kingdom involves a lot of what you civic servants strive for in your work every day. How about justice, righteousness, peace, safety? And we live in a time when that kingdom hasn't been consummated yet. So you who are guests this morning probably know better than most about the depravity of humanity uh, that makes it so obvious that God's kingdom has not truly come just yet. Maybe it's unruly constituents at a council meeting or people driving through town like it's a Formula One race strip or neighbors trying to make their own booze blowing up their garage in the process. That is a true story or even individuals, desperate individuals, seeking to take their own lives. We live in a time when the vision for God's kingdom exists, it's right in the scriptures, but we have not arrived just yet. One theologian, whose name was Oscar Kuhlman, he likened it to the time in World War II between D-Day and V-E Day. You know, uh, in the time from... D-Day, when the, the tide turned in the war and the Allies started liberating city after city and country after country in Western Europe, there were still a lot of those residents who were living in fear as if the Nazis were still in charge. It wasn't until VE Day, when the war in Europe was declared finished, that they could go back to resuming some sort of normal, though tarnished, life. The church has a picture of the world that looks more like what God originally intended, but it hasn't been restored to that yet, and so we live in a now-but-not-yet kind of time. But the church continues to talk about the, what the world will be like, and everybody else thinks we're weird. Yeah, okay. But the neat thing is that God invites us all to be captivated by his picture of a renewed earth, to be enthralled by the biblical picture of the kingdom of God. And Jesus was born not only to announce that kingdom, but to bring it to pass. That's why Christmas is so important. The announcement of Jesus' birth is a proclamation that the day is coming when the services that you, our friends, provide to keep our community orderly and safe and well will no longer be required. And I think maybe you look forward to that day as well, when justice, righteousness, peace, and safety are all just expected given parts of our world. But that time has not yet come. People inside the church 
and outside the church still continue to fail, still continue to sin, to miss the mark of God's intent, and we all need all the help we can get. But the announcement of Jesus' birth gives us hope. But don't miss this. Christmas would be meaningless if Jesus, who was born as a baby, had not later died on the cross and been raised from the dead. That's why, without Good Friday and Easter, Christmas is as hollow in meaning as the TV commercials make it out to be nowadays. We live in a now but not yet kind of time. But that time is, can be characterized less by fear and more by hope. Our hope in the resurrection of Jesus, which is also our hope in our own resurrection. I want to read you a passage from a guy named Paul, whom Jesus appointed to become the uh, person who announced God's kingdom to the non-Jewish folks, the Gentiles. And in this letter he wrote 2,000 years ago to a church in Corinth, a city in Greece you can still visit. He said some things that help us understand this now but not yet vision that the church lives by. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 to 25. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. And by that, because we are descendants of Adam, the first man, death is inevitable. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection is also inevitable. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. One great Christian of another era wrote about this verse and said, Adam is the cause of death because his sin is the judicial ground of our condemnation. And I would add to that that Jesus came to turn all that around. And that's what Christmas is all about. Paul continues, but there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first fruits of the harvest, Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come, the end of the world as we know it, uh, when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. Now, sometimes we wonder, if Jesus is God, why does he have to turn the kingdom over to the Father? But it is at the point at the time when the kingdom is consummated when, in fact, Jesus will give up his role as the divine mediator. There will no longer be a need for mediation between God and humanity because we will see him face to face just as he is. Verse 25, for Christ must reign until he humbles his enemies beneath his feet. Now that's a reference to Psalm 110 verse 1 where King David says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. And that that gets a little confusing, but as we understand it, David is referring to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, whom David prefigured. The time will come when God's kingdom is brought to full fruition, when all dominion and authority And all human powers will be brought to an end. There will be but one superpower, one authority, one higher court, and that will be the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who will reign forever and ever, as the famous Hallelujah Chorus in Handel's Messiah says. This will be the time when Jesus the Messiah will bring to completion the work of redemption. Paul said in his second letter to the church in Corinth that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Honestly, this seems kind of foreign to us, even many of us who have been part of the church for many years, because there's a sense, and I actually thought this out loud this week, that you may be thinking, Jeff, you are asking a question, answering a question that I ain't asking. But maybe it's not bad that we should be asking a question like this. After all, if you want to arrive alive when God brings his kingdom to fruition, we better pay attention. 
When we come to faith in Jesus, we have begun to catch a glimpse of the picture of God's kingdom. Now, Christian maturity helps us in that we, as we grow in faith, we start taking steps ahead in understanding the kingdom of God. Uh, David Fitch, who's a Canadian and American pastor, he's served in both countries, recently wrote a book called The Church of Us Versus Them. And in it, he... Uh, likens this now but not yet kingdom living that characterizes the church to a parent in contrast to society which is kind of like a child or a teenager and he he relays a conversation he was having with his son Max and I'm actually going to quote this for you because I think he says it really well he says I'm no smarter or dumber than Max I'm just ahead of him And so, like most parents in moments of discipline, I never see myself working against my child, trying to get him to do my will. Rather, I just see myself ahead of him, trying to help him find his way. I'm certain he doesn't always see it that way, but I've walked the paths of struggling to find myself as a person in the world. I know and understand some things he can't possibly understand at his stage of life. He doesn't even have an imagination for the way his life will look on the other side of big decisions. He does not yet understand why things work a certain way or what things can be if he just focuses his life and walks faithfully with God in certain ways. Though Max may not always feel it, I'm not against him, I'm just ahead of him. It's not a perfect analogy, but in in similar ways, the church is not against the world, it's just ahead of it. The church seems weird, Not because we're regressive and stuck in the past, though we are decidedly rooted in the past, as far back as creation itself. But in fact, the church is a step ahead of society when it comes to envisioning what the world can and should be like, God's kingdom. And it's not an exclusive club to which only a few are invited, right? All who will receive Jesus as Lord and Savior are invited to capture the picture of the kingdom of God. We're not against the world, we're a step ahead of the world, and that sometimes leaves us in conflict. We all want to arrive alive when it comes to God's kingdom, and to arrive alive we need to embrace Jesus, this babe in the manger whose advent we celebrate. We need to embrace him as Savior, as the one who saves us from our sins, and as Lord, the one who rules over our lives, the one true leader. It's easy to get lost in a fog over this, especially in these days of political polarization. Irrespective of who you vote for, though, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have but one ruler, one king, one Lord, and that is Jesus. What we read from 1 Corinthians this morning suggests that God's kingdom is about Jesus and it's about the resurrection. Not only his resurrection, but our resurrection as well. In verse 23, it said that Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. And you may be thinking, wait a minute, what about Lazarus and some of these other people Jesus raised from the dead? Well, here's the deal. The difference is, all those people Jesus raised from the dead, they went on to die again at some point. Jesus, though, did not. This is uh, an important point that the Apostle Paul makes in uh, Romans chapter 6, another letter he wrote to a, a young church. This is Romans 6, 5 to 11. Have a listen to this. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. Now pay special attention to verse 9. We are sure of this. Because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Now when we talk about fears, most of us are thinking about heights or public speaking, or spiders, or snakes, or crowds. But at the core of each of those common fears is the biggest fear of them all, and that is death. 
The resurrection of Jesus means that we will all experience resurrection, not like a cat with nine lives, but when God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, as Jesus' model prayer says, we too will be raised from death. Those who love Jesus Christ and follow him will be raised to eternal life. Those who reject Jesus, sadly, will be raised to eternal punishment. That's a hard word, but it's the witness of the New Testament. So the coming of Jesus inaugurates God's kingdom. He sets us free by his death from the burden of sin. His resurrection promises us resurrection, and his return consummates God's kingdom. It all starts, though, with the announcement of the baby's birth. Peace on earth, goodwill toward all people. The babe in the manger is Lord of all. To arrive alive, we need to receive the baby in the manger as more than just a baby. We need to receive him as Lord. Fear not, said the angel. And if we embrace Jesus for who he claimed to be, we will not need to fear. We will live in hope. To wit... I offer you an instructive word from a little-known theologian whose name is Linus. Have a look at this. Turn it up, Adam. I swear that had sound when I put the link in. (laughs) Well, rather than show it, uh, unless they get it in the next few seconds, let me just explain it to you. This is from uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas movie. And at one point, Linus begins to recite the Christmas story. And when the angels make the announcement, and they say, fear not, what happens? But Linus drops his security blanket. And I don't think that was an accident on the part of Charles M. Schultz. I don't think that it was an accident that when he said, fear not, he dropped the thing that mattered most to him in life, the thing that Lucy and others were always trying to take away from him. And of course, he picked it up again. After he finished his little soliloquy, he does pick it up. But in the end, he drops it again for good around the Christmas tree as the gathered throng sings. And as one pastor pointed out in a a blog post I read, not only does he think this was intentional on the part of Charles Schultz, and I think it was too, but in contemporary society, they gather around that Christmas tree and probably sing, oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, how lovely are thy branches, which is how I learned it when I was in grade four. Um, but what do they sing instead? They si- See, there goes the dropped blanket. Fear not. Let's take my word for it. <laughs> what do they sing when this is all over? They sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And they still play it on television, believe it or not. The Christmas tree is for us, thanks for trying Adam and those who helped him, appreciate that. (laughs) The Christmas tree is for me and it can be for you a foreshadowing of the cross. Linus took everything that that security blanket meant to him and he wrapped it around that tree which foreshadowed the cross. And you and I can take whatever fears, whatever insecurities, whatever burdens we have, and we can lay them at the foot of the cross. And why we can do that is because of the birth of Jesus. That's why we can talk about this stuff at Christmas time. When we do that, embracing Jesus as the Lord who casts out our fear and brings us back to life from death, we begin to catch a glimpse of God's kingdom. 
Now, with all that said, what can you do in response? Well, you will find in your bulletin, attached to it and perforated for your convenience, a connection card. And I want to encourage everybody to fill this out. This isn't just for guests, this is for everybody. You can fill out the front part, which gives me some information. I promise I won't spam your inbox, but I, I will follow up and thank you. So if you'll fill that out, that'll be great. And then on the back, I offer you some next steps that you might take as a result of this message. If the idea of a kingdom of justice, righteousness, peace, and safety is your idea of what life should be, you can check off, I want to arrive alive. I embrace Jesus as Savior and Lord so that I can experience resurrection life in his kingdom. And if you do that, I'll follow up with you because this is the most important decision you will ever make. You are saying to God, I can't do this on my own. I cannot save myself. I can't be good enough to save myself. I turn away from sin and I turn to you, God, and I want to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior so that I can experience resurrection power. If you will do that, I will follow up with you and give you some tools to encourage you. Now, if you're living with fear, no matter what that fear may be, you can place it at the foot of the cross, just as Linus placed his security blanket at the foot of the tree. And you can check off, I am placing my fear at the foot of the cross of Jesus, whose resurrection sets me free from that fear. Please pray for me. And I will pray for you and follow up with you to encourage you as you are set free. Or you can say, I will pray daily for those who serve our community. If you will pray for these guests and those who serve alongside them, check that off. And I hope you all will, because I'd love to follow up with them and say just how much prayer support they have from St. Paul's. To arrive alive, it's not just a matter of don't drink and drive or arrive, drive sober. It's about Jesus by whose birth and life and death and resurrection and return we can know the promise of God's kingdom where all who live by faith can be truly, truly alive. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into the world as a little baby. And thank you that it's so much more than that. Thank you that you lived a full human life without sin, that you died a criminal's death on a cross for our sins, and that you rose from the dead to stamp out the power of death, and that you will come again to bring your kingdom to bear. Give us grace to believe and to live as those characterized not by fear, but by faith in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Help us all, Lord, to arrive alive. Amen. As we close, we will sing the carol that the folks around Charlie Brown's Christmas tree sang. Hark the herald angels sing.